There are tons of bass gadgets that claim to make you a better bassist by leveling up your practice, creativity, tone, or technique. Are they legit useful tools though, or is it just marketing BS? Always be closing. Always be closing. I put these 10 gadgets to the test to find out. No affiliate links, no sponsors, no BS. Let's just see if they rock or if they suck. I broke these 10 base gadgets up into three categories, creativity boosters, practice improvers, and utility gear. Each gadget will get a rating on the awesome meter of either get it, meaning it's awesome, you should get it right now, shortlist it, meaning it's pretty awesome and you might wanna get it, think about it, think, think about it, if it's worth considering at all, and forget it if it just plain sucks. I'll also give my ratings via dramatic facial expression. Let's dig in. First up is the Creative Tunings Spider Capo, which lets you capo individual strings, which gives you a lot more customizable tunings than a standard capo. Capos are a high utility gadget for guitar players because they allow them to move their chord shapes around different keys easily, but as bass players, since we're mostly just playing single notes, a capo is usually more of a hindrance than a help because you need to be able to play in different keys and in different parts of the neck easily and smoothly, and using a capo just to play in a different key is going to hold you back from learning that skill. But if you like weird tunings and playing chords and using open strings and playing harmonics and stuff, then this gadget might be for you. My rating, translation, think about it. Think, think about it. Uh, there are really cool things about this that I like. I don't know of another product like this, and I really like quirky tunings and exploring that stuff. Never on a gig, but just for fun at home. Uh, so I like the idea of this. The actual execution and build quality is a little mixed. The core feels like solid metal that I feel confident about, but the actual fingers that do the capoing are like cheap plastic that's really poorly cut and I don't have a lot of faith in them. And these uh, long triangly points on the non-active end of the fingers are too long so they get in the way if you're trying to play on the fret right next to your capo. Um, but at about $25, this thing's not that much more expensive than a normal capo, and it allows you to do a lot of stuff you can't normally do. But for less money, you can get a really solid, nice standard capo like this Shub, um, which will do a better job at being a normal capo, but it doesn't allow you to do all the cool, weird spider capo stuff. This is the TC Electronic Eon String Sustainer. It's modeled after the Ebo, and it sends out a small magnetic field that causes the string to vibrate. I don't know how that works, but let's see how it sounds. Translation, think about it. Think, think about it. Uh, my rating, think about it, is less about the Eon specifically and more about string sustainers on bass. I think the Eon is a solid string sustainer, but for the things we do as bass players, uh, it's kind of a weird gadget because it's really hard to predict when your note is going to start. And as a bass player, it's really important that your notes start at the right time. So the only way I can see this being useful in a standard bass playing context is maybe just to hit. Uh, you know, to like hold a long note at the end of a song and like make some fun sound effects like I was doing. But for actual bass playing, not super useful. The Eon is only about $67, which is, did I say Aeon earlier? It should be Eon. It looks like Aeon. Uh, it's about $30 cheaper than the Ebo, 
and it's similar kind of sound. You don't have the harmonic mode that you have on the Plus Ebo. Also, string sustainers may work better on some basses than others. For example, I tested it on the Cirrus for you because I could not get it to work on the jazz bass. It's probably my fault because I'm not that good with a string sustainer, but I just couldn't get it working. This is the Guitar Triller. It's a multi-surface string striker that you can use to get a bunch of interesting sounds. Translation, shortlist it. There's a lot of really cool things about this. It's cheap, it's well built, it's a cool idea, I've never seen anything like it, and you can get sounds out of it that I've never heard from any other gadget. Uh, on the downside, I can't super imagine personally using this in a bass playing in a band context, but I bet somebody could who was more clever than I am with gadgets like this. I've only had this thing for a couple weeks, so I feel I've really failed to explore the full possibilities of the gadget. Um, and it could really inspire some interesting new ideas. Plus, you could probably use it as like a toothpick or something. This is the Vox Amplug 2 bass headphone amp. This plugs straight into your bass, which I won't do right now because I'm already plugged in and then you can practice through headphones so you don't annoy your neighbors or wake up your family. Translation, get it. Whether you're a beginner just looking for a cheap, silent practice solution, or if you're a pro touring musician who needs an easy way to practice in hotel rooms, which is how I've used it, um, this thing is really useful. And at only 40 or $45, the price is right. It's much cheaper than getting some crappy practice amp, and you'll actually get a good tone out of this thing. Just make sure you use some kind of headphones that can actually reproduce bass. I use these like $10 Skull Candies I got a decade ago, and they work great, but don't use something like Apple earbuds that are super thin. By the way, there's a ton of discussion about how to set up your practice space on the Bass Buzz forum, people talking about different ways that they plug in and listen to themselves and a track at the same time. So if that's something you're trying to dial in, you can check out the link in the description to hear how other people have figured that out. Next is the Blackstar Fly 3 Bass Practice Amp. The idea with this thing is you can easily carry it around so you always have an amp with you on the go. <laughs> Kind of sounds like something's wrong with it, right? That's because it's a three watt amp going into a three inch speaker. Translation, it can't handle your bass. At non-distorted volumes, you can barely hear it. I can hardly hear it. Oh, you have to be deaf to hear that. And if I turn it up, then I get all this yucky distortion that I can't get rid of. And the worst part of it is that no matter what knob I crank, I can never get the feeling of bass in the room. The tone might sound okay at the lower volumes, but I'm not feeling bass. So don't be fooled by other review videos where the tone maybe sounds fine. It's not about the tone that you hear, it's about the bass that you feel, or in this case, don't feel. My rating? Translation? Forget it! If you want something cheap and quiet, get the Vox headphone amp. If you want a real amp, get a real amp. The Fender Rumble 40 is my favorite cheap beginner amp. That's the smallest amp I've found that still sounds decent. I really wish somebody would make a bass travel amp like this that didn't completely suck. I hate this thing. I hate the Roland bass micro cube. It completely lacks bottom end, just like this. And the Phil Jones gear is nicer, but it's expensive and heavy. So if somebody could make a small, lightweight bass amp that actually felt like bass in the room using some kind of psychoacoustic magic, I think we would all want to buy it. Next up, let's look at a couple tuners, a clip-on and a plug-in. We've got the TC Electronic Unitune Clip 
and the Korg TM50. Let's see how good these tuners are. I'm gonna compare the TC and the Korg to the Peterson Strobo Plus HD, which is like 150 bucks. It's like the emperor of tuners. So I'm running my bass. The TC will pick up the signal directly from the vibration of the headstock, and then I'm running the signal into the Peterson and then through into the Korg. So let's see how they work. So what I'm noticing as I do this is that if I look at the TC for reference and I tune to the TC, sometimes I'm still a hair out on the Korg and the Peterson, but the Peterson always seems to agree with the Korg. If I tune this in tune on the Korg, then that gets me pretty clean on the Peterson. And the TC likes it too, it's just not getting me quite as close. The response speed overall is really good too. The Korg is almost keeping up with the Peterson even though it's later in the chain and the TC is nice and fast. My rating for both of these tuners. Translation, get it. The Unitune clip is awesome. I have tried every clip on tuner for bass. Most of them suck really badly. So the Unitune clip is a little more expensive than average, but hey, it actually tunes your bass. Uh, it works just as well as the Polytune clip. It's just cheaper. This is $29. The Polytune clip is about $49 and you don't really need the polytuning thing for bass. Uh, and the Korg is a no-brainer. Korg has been making great tuners for many years. I used to have the TM40, which was great. This is the TM50. Now they're onto the TM60, so that's probably the one you should get. But it's got tuner, a uh, sound generator, a backlight, a metronome that does all the things you need a metronome to do. Uh, and this is what I use for my morning practice uh, for a metronome. This is a Groove Gear fret wrap, which straps onto your neck to keep your strings from ringing when you're not playing them, and more. My rating for the fret wrap. Translation, somewhere between a shortlist it and a get it. Let's call it a shortlist it. The thing is that good muting technique is really important as a bass player. You need to be able to keep strings from ringing that you're not playing. Otherwise, you're gonna send a big dirty jumble of low end to the rest of the band and it's not gonna feel good. So I think it's really important to be able to do that without using a gadget like this. But the thing is that the fret wrap can do other cool things that aren't just compensating for bad muting technique. It can really help clean up the sound when you're doing tapping because it cuts down on the noise you get from the other side of the string clanking around um, and just reduces overtones in general. So I really like that. And it's also a nice way to get your open string tone to match your fretted tone when you're doing fretting hand muting a la Rocco Prestia of Tower of Power. What that means is if I'm fretting with my index finger, then I'm resting other fingers on the string right past it to get this kind of muted sound rather than the open sound. So without the fret wrap, let's scoot it back, it's not on the string. Without the fret wrap, if I mute th this E and then I play this E, they don't really match because this is just open unmuted and then this is muted. So if I have the fret wrap hovering past the nut, I can match that tone a little better. I think it's fair to say that fret wraps are a solid upgrade from the old putting a hairband on the neck trick, which I first saw Victor Wooten do. I'm sure he got it from somewhere else. Um, hairbands are really cheap, so it obviously makes it a more favorable solution in that way, but you don't get as much muting as with the fret wrap because they're a lot skinnier. And I've also found it so <laughs> insanely difficult to find hair bands that are the right size and elasticity to get around a headstock, but then be tight enough to fit on the neck. Even This one didn't even work. I had to tie this knot in it, so now it fits, but I can't get it off the base without untying the knot. So just for all around ease of use and everything, um, I really like the fret wrap. And you might not believe this, but the fret wrap can even help make people less annoying. Here's a demonstration. Please like this video and subscribe to Bass Buzz and make sure to click the bell so you get notified when new lessons come out. <laughs> Here's another gadget by Groove Gear called the Fump. It's a bridge side string dampener that you just slide on like this to get a more muted old school tone.
My rating? Uh, the translation, think about it, I guess. Think, think about it. It's almost to forget it but it's a really good idea. It's just been executed really badly. This is basically a replacement for the old school solution, which is foam. And bases used to ship stock with bridge covers that had foam in them underneath the strings. And so that's where that sound being vintage came from. So this is supposed to be a level up on the foam because you can slide it on and off really easily. So you could do that between songs on a gig and it's a lot easier than sneaking the foam under, which takes maybe 10 or 15 seconds. And this just takes like, one or two seconds. But uh, the problem, which you may have heard in my demo, is that you don't get even muting. You get a lot of muting on the E and the A string, and then way less on the D and the G strings because they're further away from this joint, and it's kind of like opening outward like a little alligator mouth. Don't buy this, it's not worth the money with its current design flaws. I feel like they could fix that really easily by just putting a little Velcro uh, attachment right here like they have on the fret wrap so that you can tighten this end of it as well and even out the muting you're getting across your strings. So the foam's a cool idea but there's still things I like better about just using some foam. First of all this costs nothing. You can get it from a dumpster at a mattress store um, <laughs> and the, e the muting is a lot more even now because it doesn't have that joint closing problem that the foam had and also I can slide this around a little more easily get even more muting. So Groove Gear needs to step up the design on this thing to make it as cool and useful as the fret wrap is. Um, at this point, I think foam is a better solution, and plus you can experiment with different kinds of foam and find the right thickness and density and stuff, get a lot of different sounds that way. But if you really need to be able to very quickly get your bridge mute on and off, then you might want to get this and just customize what material you have in here. Maybe you could have it thicker on this end than it is on this end to compensate for the design flaw. This is the Hipshot Extender Drop Tuner. It replaces your normal tuner and it's a way that you can quickly change to alternate tunings on the fly. Rating. Translation, get it. This is the drop tuner, it's so awesome, and if your band plays any Rage Against the Machine covers, you definitely need this. Uh, it's just, there's so many cool things you can do with it. I've used this for years on this bass. Uh, I used to play in a band that played a lot of Celtic music and a lot of that stuff is in D, so it was really helpful to be able to switch back and forth during the show without having to fuss and look at a tuner and just all, all that stuff. And you can also change tunings during a song really easily like you saw me do earlier, which you just can't do with your hands unless you're very, 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 very good at it. And I've never seen anyone do that on earth except for Victor Wooten. This is the most expensive gadget I reviewed at around $100, and it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes to install on your own. You need some basic tool competency, just like a screwdriver and stuff like that. Um, but if you need to be able to get to drop tunings quickly, it's so worth it. It's such good stuff. I normally just use this to drop down from E to D, but apparently you can use it from anywhere to an E flat, just a half step below your normal tuning, all the way down to a B, a perfect fourth below where you normally tune. So let's ch check that out. I haven't actually tested this, so I'm gonna be finding out with you if it actually works. Okay, it works on an E flat. Here's E, here's E flat, here's E, here's E flat. Let's try B. There it is, the drop B. E, B. pretty wild. Our tenth and final gadget is a strange triangular piece of plastic that you put between your fingers to pluck the strings. I believe some call it a pick. Okay, I'm just kidding. I know what a pick is. I'm not great with one, but I have used them on gigs and recording sessions. Picks are an awesome cheap way to get a totally different tone out of your bass with a much stronger attack that's a little bit more naturally aggressive. So my rating, get it. Thank you.